We're going live, Ma. Okay. Good evening, change makers and social innovators in Africa and all over the world. We welcome you to an exciting edition of the Social Impact Webinar. Now, I believe you guys are in here. Please, let's see you in the comment section. Um, begin to introduce yourself. Share with us where you are watching from any part of the world. Um, we'd like to hear from you. And definitely, we also have in the studio our amazing executive director, Debola Dejakurumi. Ma, you have the floor. Thank you so much. Excited to be here. And um, I mean, thank you so much for the great, great work that you do with the amazing team at Ideation Hub Africa. For sure, this is, uh, this should be a great night. I mean, the quality of answers that we get is also connected to um, the, the quality of questions that we ask. So it feels like, you know, you are the one who is in the spotlight. Um, I'm here to share our story. Um, I'm happy to talk about, you know, whatever you want me to talk about. And uh, we possibly would also draw some insights from and questions from um, what our friends and families share with us tonight that they want to learn about. But I feel like a great way to start is for you to actually talk a bit about uh, what the team is working on and what we are getting ready to launch uh, in the course of the coming week. All right, Mark. Thank you so much, Mark. All right, I'm super pumped, I'm super excited to announce that in another um, two days or less, we will be launching the second edition of the African Masterclass series. Um, I know most of you are, most of you in here were part of the pioneering edition, and you can attest to the fact that it was really transformational. And if you were part of AMS one, I bet it with you, AMS two is times two bigger. And um, this edition is themed the burden social innovator in African storytelling series. And we, what, we have, what have we done? We have, we have brought together, we bring bringing together burden social innovators who are making real time social impact in the different impact areas. And they just come around to share with us their journey, share with us challenges that they may have faced in the course of their journey. Also share with us um, opportunities and also um, ecosystems they have leveraged that has resulted into the tremendous growth and transformation as individuals and within their organization. So I'm, I'm, I'm encouraging you right now, if you are yet to register for the um, African Masterclass Series 2, please, please visit our website, visit www.africanmasterclass.org forward slash AMS2 and just from a click of a button, you can simply register. Definitely, we will drop the um, what's it called the link to register in the comment section, and definitely you can click on it to register. But so that you don't uh, miss out on what we have in store tonight, I would say just stay in because there's so much more ahead of us. We are going to be milking our executive director here, yeah, where she will be sharing with us. You know, the amazing, yes, the amazing and the very interesting journey of IHA. How did IHA, you know, start? How did we, you know, um, birth this very great organization, this multinational called Ideation of Africa? So let me warmly welcome everyone in the studio. Uh, I can see um, Arewa. Good evening, Arewa. You're, you're joining us from Lagos, Nigeria. Elizabeth. Oyok as well is also in the studio with us. I can see Busaya as well. So keep the comments coming in. Sophia, you're most welcome. I can see other persons. Please keep it coming in. So we just want you know, some of, most of you to settle in. In another two minutes, we will officially kick off. I can also see Adios, Adios Shun Day in the studio with us, and she's joining us from Erua. Wow. You're most welcome. Um, keep the comments coming in. We are here for you, and definitely we're super excited to have you join us at um, this amazing edition of the Social Impact Webinar with TDK. Esther Richie, let us know where you're joining us from, which part of the world. 
Um, which part of um, Africa? Which part of Nigeria are you joining us from? I can see you, you know, putting in a laughter emoji. I know you're super pumped and excited about tonight. You're joining from Ife. You're most welcome, Esther Richies. We're excited to have you on board as well. Um, yes, yes. So we have shared the link in there. You can just click on it and, you know, if you're not registered. All right. So we will get into um, today's um, discourse and um, we will kick off with the very first question. We know the stories have been known to be a powerful way of teaching, learning and impacting the minds of people. By showing people a glimpse of someone's experience, they can gain actionable insights they need part time. Um, Ma, you have been a source of inspiration across many of your different expressions. But with Ideation of Africa, how did it start? How did you start, you know, um, Ideation of Africa? Okay, so thank you so much for having me. Um, obviously, I'm at home. This is family. I mean, and again, great work that you're doing as project director at Ideation of Africa great work to every team member, great work to our amazing volunteers. Um, and I mean, what we've accomplished together is just stunning. And there is still a great way ahead of us um, in the vision that we carry for the continent. So Ideation of Africa started with a burden that would not leave me, particularly for my service year. While I was in the university, I've always been the sort of person that would go to secondary schools you know, talk to the young girls. I've always been passionate about just uh, paying it forward, connecting with younger people. Um, so while I was in the university, secondary school girls were just like, they had my heart and I was always sort of reaching out to them and everything. And then I got to, uh, to service year and I was posted to Songwater you know, in Ogun State. Um, and when I got there, I mean, I was in utter shock about the state of education. I had my mm. first degree in Oshun State, um, Obafemi Awolowo University, Ileife Oshun State. And I, 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 I had a first, first sense uh, of connection with the public education. So I wasn't a stranger to public uh, uh, secondary education, even public primary education. But when I got to um, Songwater, and this is not to highlight it in a negative light because there are amazing things going on there, I, I, um, I worked as a research uh, associate at Covenant University, which was the foundation for so many other things I started to do. But I got to Ogun State, Songwater to be precise. Yeah. I started to interact with the primary school students, the secondary school students, carrying on on my conversations around um, nation building, chastity, self and personal discovery, and not letting your background impact your possibilities in life. But I was like, I remember that one of my earliest sessions, I was talking about don't let your background, you know, put your back on the ground. But when I got into the school, I almost felt like, man, it's going to be tough. Oh, I was almost discouraged myself about the degree mm. of, you know, just disconnect from a sense mm. of ability and, you know, how broken the education system in that school seemed. And so I felt like my work was cut out for me that I needed to really start to think about a long-term engagement, right, as a social impact maker. I, mm. the, the social impact space wasn't clear. At best, I started to say maybe I would volunteer with an NGO or maybe I will run an NGO. No, my thought was I would ultimately own an NGO mm. that was focused on girls and young people and education. But that was where the birding started. I started to go from school to school, and I saw that the public secondary education was not, uh, it wasn't uh, structured in, in a way that would help the average young boy or girl that I was meeting really prepare mm. for the future and be properly positioned for opportunities, right? It mm. seemed like they were disadvantaged from get go. And that, that mm. birding me so much. And then I saw that they were also so disenfranchised from the Nigerian mm. dream. You know, they did not mm. seem happy to be Nigerians. They felt like the government had failed them. And so a lot of our classes will continue to just move along the lines of personal development, uh, discovering your identity as a person, and then on to nation building and uh, recognizing the values that made you able to build a nation in your own little way. 
So by the time I was uh, rounding up for my uh, service year, and I'm sorry if my story is getting long. I had been told. No, Ma, we are enjoying you. Please, Ma, you have the floor. Yes, Ma, that's Thank why we are you. here. Yes, Thank ma. you. So I built all these very exciting relationships with these young people. I remember when I told them I was leaving, my service year was over, we were crying. You know, they were so touched. And so I determined that before I left, I was sort of going to um, do something that would make me feel like, okay, I'm, I'm sort of really creating a legacy from my experience with these young people. And so I planned uh, what was then called the Nigerian Young Leaders Forum. Nigerian wow. Young Leaders Forum. And I, I this so this was in 2008. Wow. This was in, yeah, I think 2009. That was nice. the end of the service year, 2009. At the end of my service year, 2009. So I went to these different schools I had been working with all around Adodota, local government in Songwater. And we had maybe about 10 schools. We brought them together, uh, reached out, sent these invitations to them, arranged for buses to bring them. And I worked with the local government chairman at that time who also uh, sponsored us financially. And we, we got this hall, the local government hall, and, and we brought representatives. They were dressed excellently. We had told them, wear your best, you know, arrive early. There's a competition you know, and all of that. So they got in early. Um, and then I got my friends. I got a number of my friends who were also passionate about Nigeria to come speak to them. I had Akintunde Bada, Albert Afolabi, and a number of others um, brought them over. Uh, I got books by one of my proteges who had written a book at the time. She gave me free copies. And then I got that as well. My friend gave me copies of her book too, Shadiola Juni. I got that. I was so excited. So we had all these representatives. I think it was even 13 schools, male, female. Um, and then we said, talk to them about Nigeria, talk to them about their future and how their backgrounds and their current circumstances didn't have to, you know, hold them back from mm. experiencing the future, but they had to carry a dream. And then we had this debate competition. We had this fashion competition. It was so good. Wow. And we gave awards and all of that. And I came back to Lagos and I was okay for a few months. I was like, uh, I helped those children and hey, that's yes. it. And I moved on. So I got to Lagos and then I started working uh, in a human capacity development firm with my mentor, Mrs. Bisola Lunge. And I was just having a great time. I was building my HR career, minding my business and all of that. Boom, a year down the line, the burden comes back all over again. Like, Debola, what are you doing? How are you not going to be actively involved involved in building this nation? You know, all the things I saw, all the cases of rape, all the cases of sexual abuse, all the cases mm. of financial inability, everything came back. The burden came mm. back. I started remembering those girls, you know, those boys, those little ones. I would be crying. I would be like, what can I do? And then I was constantly faced with the... Um, uh, what is what I call the ocean drop fallacy, right? And maybe yeah. that's you know, my first lesson here. Every okay. impact maker, every social savior is going to be faced with the ocean drop fallacy. And it's mm. a first thing that confronts you, making you feel like your little is not going to count. When you look mm. at the unity of the wicked problems and the rot in society, it's possible for you to feel like your work is just going to be a drop in the ocean and it's not going to matter. And that started to come to me like, what can I do? I'm just a young girl trying to find my way. You see, but he wasn't leaving me. He wasn't leaving me, right? So at that time, the, uh, I start, uh, got into the organization 2019, the burden came back 2010. So I said, I don't know what to do. But I started to go back to secondary schools and I started to volunteer. Uh, one of the first organizations mm -hmm. I volunteered with is Hesi Health Initiative, run by mm -hmm. Isaiah Olabi and uh, Rhoda Robinson. And I think another person, they, they're the co-founders, doing such a brilliant work. So I started to volunteer with Hesi Health Initiative and I became a girl child ambassador. So I would go to secondary schools, have conversations mm -hmm. with them, you know, and I started to feel that sense of fulfillment, right? That yes, I'm making a difference. This is the path I want to be on. While I'm mm. building a spiritual career, on one side, I also wanted to impact community. And that was good for that time. So I did that from 
2010, 11, 12. And then in 2012, when I became a girl child ambassador, I had gone to, and this was a big light bulb moment for me. I just had mm. a baby. Um, yeah, I just had a baby that year. Wow. And I was on this bounce back body. I was feeling myself, right? <laughs> so uh, Hazy Health invited me to, um, I think, a global girl child uh, conference. And we had it in Unilag. And I was, you know, invited as an ambassador, told the things I would start to work on as an ambassador and all that. And we had a number of NGOs present, okay? Mm -hmm. So we had a number of NGOs present. And then I started to talk to them because don't forget, I thought after some years in, yeah. in my HR practice, I was going to start a, an NGO, NGO for NGO. children. So I started That's to talk to them like, how is the work going? I was so excited. And here is the thing that I found, Tony, that I can never forget. Mm -hmm. Almost every non-governmental organization or non-profit, as we call them, that I spoke to, didn't sound excited. Excited. Hmm. Yeah. So I, I was just like, how can you be changing the world and you're not excited? Every, they're just hmm. like, ah, the, the work is much. And, you know, we don't have funding. We don't have, hmm. you know, things are, you know, just complaining and complaining. And I'm like, okay, nobody seems excited about this work. This is what I want to quit my consulting career to come and step into, right? And then it didn't seem like they had a lot of answers for me. Mm. There was so much vagueness, even though they were the ones playing in the space. I was asking questions. I wasn't getting clear answers. So I remember leaving and saying to myself, I have to start mine so I can make a difference. Ah, what kind mm. of thing? These guys are not sounding excited. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> so that takes me on to the next thing a social next. innovator will face. A social mm. innovator is going to face what is called the bogusness of, of passion or what is called mm. the fallacy of a bogus passion. Many times our passion is not often grounded in relevant data. It's not often grounded in intelligence and it's not intelligence like are you smart or not? It's intelligence that is driven by research and data. So we have mm. this bogus passion fallacy where you're just like, we're going to change the world. Nobody has been doing it right. What is happening? I remember going home that day and feeling like, ah, I got home and told my husband that all these NGOs, they're just like acting mediocre. They're not passionate and, oh, they don't know what they're doing. I'm going to go in there and make a difference. And I'm sure it's just like this girl and different passions, right? <laughs> so this was 2012. Yeah. But then I was working more with the schools. I was seeing where the problems were and my mm. passion was growing. Right. Uh, by 2013, I applied for a Coca-Cola Foundation funding um, mm. so that I could get into an Atlantic University. I continued mm. to search for the education that I needed because I wanted to get into the NGO space. And so I was like, who is going to teach me what I need to know? I'm asking these NGO guys. They don't seem to have answers, right? I was reading and I was following Mrs. Uh, in, Miss Ine Onuk at that time, she's now Mrs. Ine Abimbola, the CEO of uh, Thiso Praxis. I was following her and I was following Faith Foundation's work. And this is also like a big lesson. One of the preparatory steps for any impact maker, social savior, when you want to start off a work is the power of mentorship. I was following everything yeah. Mrs. In Abimbola was doing, listening to her, I was crazy about her. I, I saw her as the future I wanted to step into, right? Mm. Yeah, so I was, I, um, I then started to say, what education do I need? And that's a lesson as yeah. well. You've got to start to read, really take the courses. And I don't know why anybody who wants to make a difference in Africa will not be in AMS. I don't understand yeah. it. Like, tell me why. It's even free. Like, right I now. don't get it. I don't <laughs> get it, right? So I started to ask those questions. Who's going to train me? What education do I require? What mentorship do I require? What certifications do I require? And let me tell you what, whatever you're searching for is what the environment starts to move in your direction. That's what you start to, it's really powerful. I see it happening even in my life now. The moment your heart is burning for something and you start to search for it, the algorithms of the environment and of life begin to move that thing in your direction. And that's what happened to me. When the mm -hmm. uh, uh, social sector management program opened that year in 2012 into 13, 
I saw it and I wasn't meant to see it. I just saw it randomly online. I was like, oh my God, this is what I need. Social sector management, boom. So I applied to Coca-Cola Foundation for a counterpart funding, went for the interviews and 40 of us were selected of the, you know, maybe thousands that applied. I don't know the numbers in particular, but we were selected, 40 of us, I was so excited, right? And then guess I did a crazy thing. I thought about it enough and I said, I'm going to quit my work with Philips Consulting at the brink of another promotion and get into my social sector space, right? And that's what I did. Everybody thought I was crazy, but what I was able to negotiate that I think maybe was a wise thing was I got an external consulting role with Philips Consulting. So I was still a part of the firm in terms mm. of facilitating for them, uh, mm. being a part of the learning development process, but I was now like an ex-now consultant. Excellent. And I thought I was good. I really loved it. So I got into Pan-Atlantic University on this mm. postgraduate diploma. It was everything I needed. It was so good. Till today, it's still an important reference on my work. Mm. I'm still proud of you know Pan-Atlantic University Enterprise Development Center. That was the beginning of the key education mm. why because impact makers need double the education that mm. for profit counterparts because the terrain is understudied we're in an understudy terrain so you learn mm. as you go along and you need as much help as you can get yes but Tony, this is now where i'm going which is the biggest part of my story yes <laughs> we're excited to this program spent almost a year there and let me tell you what I discovered. Mm. My big light bulb moment happened in the, I think it was 11 months of being in that program. Tony, every time I spoke to my colleagues in that program, what I discovered was they had the passion, they had the calling, mm. they had the mm. desire. You know, they were sold mm. out. They had the devotion to change lives. Mm. They had using their money mm. to do it. But I come in from a consultant, a consulting background. I recognize that mm. passion was not enough. They didn't have the education. They didn't have the, the, mm. the needed system and structures, the processes to build organizations and institutions. They didn't have a sufficient mm. entrepreneurial drive to, to be able to create funding internally for their work. Do you see? Mm. So I started to see mm. these guys have the calling, the passion, but they need the education. They need the hiring, uh, recruit, recruiting processes and systems, right? They need the ecosystem. They need alternative funding strategies. They need mm. data orientation. They needed to think in a different way. Mm. They needed to step out of that, me that mediocrity thing that comes with running an NGO. They needed to start to think like business owners. Yes. Do you understand? Even if yes. what they were earning wasn't profit but purpose, but thinking like business owners, even if they were not for profit, they were not for loss. Yes. So here's what happened. I went through that program and day after day, I, I would be like, oh my God, I'm getting it. This was my discovery. I did not need to be one more NGO. I needed to create an ecosystem institution for the NGOs and the impact makers where I can provide them education consulting, advisory, support, networking, awards, conferences, boom. Th that was my light bulb moment. I was like, oh my God, I don't want to be an NGO. I don't have to be an NGO. There are already enough NGOs playing NGOs. in the girl child space, playing in health, education, infrastructure, energy and environment, agriculture, everywhere. But how about they have connection points where they can come, grow together, learn for free and for pay, right? And build the yeah. funds, fundraising strategies and internal social enterprise models, right? Where yeah. even though you're an NGO, you still have a part of your, of your model that allows you earn. So you are not permanently yeah. depending on, on donors, right? And that yeah. was how, so I, I went through that program 2013 yeah. into 2014, and in 2015, January, I started Idation of Africa. Woo! <laughs> wow. Wow. Wow, wow, wow. It's almost like it took you, um, you were taking on like a seven-year journey. 
you started the body started 2008 and this ecosystem institution called ideation of africa was eventually birthed in 2015 wow and one thing you did all through that process you were elevating to the next level of what was required to birth that vision so you didn't run off in 2008 when you, even when you started serving volunteering to create an ngo when that body was in there you started you know to seek the knowledge the education the skill set and the certification required even at that time when you were still still unaware of you know what was really 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 on the inside of you what you really wanted to do but along the line as you began to interact with players it became clear wow 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 and this takes us to the next question man wow now we know that um just as you have said, people would say um, people suddenly step into limelight. But even with what you have shared with us, we can see the journey of process that even Birth and Ideation of Africa went through. So we want you to share with us, Mar, the early years of starting Ideation of Africa. How did it look like? You know, when you kick started it in 2015, you know, how did how, how was it? You know, you 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 had gotten the skill set, you have the certification, but I'm sure it didn't come easy like that. So we want to hear with hear the story of how okay. you started from 2015. So 2015, I would say the first two years, um, uh, we were we were okay. Um, we went basically in the first two years um, testing an idea. The mm. first years yeah i could say maybe 12 months actively but in the broader mm. context about the first 24 months was really testing an idea discarding what could not work at that time validating mm. what could work and then taking it to the market wow um, so yeah i wasn't fixated and it's something mm. that I, I love it wow. you know is a value for is a valuable tool and lesson for entrepreneurs visionaries impact makers i wasn't so you know sometimes i feel like the mistake that um impact makers make is that they fixate on the problem definition and you know yeah. we spoke about in one of our webinars there's a problem yes. definition that needs yeah where you, you're just like this is why this is what is creating this problem. But we're not even sure. The reason you take noodles and back to school pack and books to children um, is because you think that's a crisis with education. But sometimes you just have to be with them long enough for you to discover that sometimes why a girl is not coming to school is because she doesn't have menstrual pads and she doesn't mm. want to get embarrassed. embarrassed. Or she's stressed about how her mom is beating, uh, is being beaten by her dad, and she's psychologically mm. impacted. Or mm. she's getting sexual advances from her intro tech teacher, and that's why she doesn't come to his classes. You know, so you've got to hang around with the beneficiaries of a proposed solution or the recipient mm. in a in a community of a possible solution. You know, and that's how you start to really iterate. I did iterate and reiterate what the possible solutions would be. So mm -hmm. when I said we were basically wow. validating um, an idea, the, the primary idea was um, beyond passion and calling, there are core utilities that a, an impact-making organization requires if it's going to grow and scale an NGO or social impact business or enterprise requires funding, data, education, ecosystem, and an entrepreneurial mindset for them to grow, to scale, to make the right partnerships, ETC. So we're basically testing the other things that make an, a, a nonprofit thrive more than just surviving. We were testing those things, but we were not sure. And the way not to have boardroom analysis, where you just sit in a boardroom and you're pointing fingers and saying this is the problem, especially in Africa, you can't, you can't, it's a wicked problem you're dealing with. You can't yes, be too yes. to draw those conclusions because the rot runs deep. 
And sometimes a problem's mother was given birth to by a problem whose mother was given birth to by a problem. Mm. Deep. So, mm. what, so as an example, when we started Ideation Hub uh, in January, the first thing I did was I started to hold small brainstorm sessions with people in the space, just asking mm. questions. What are you going through? What are you going through? What are you going through? What are the challenges? What What do you believe that if you had would significantly make a big difference in, in the results that you're getting currently. You know, what has helped you grow? What is holding you back? People will talk about, we need, you know, they'll talk about funding. Then I will force yeah. them to say, if you had funding, what other things, you know, and they will try to go deeper and deeper until the scale started to fall, that it wasn't just funding alone, because that's what they always say. If we have yes. funding, you know, and then you say, calm down. You've had funding, even if it meant your own money and your husband's money. What other challenges do you face at that time? You know, and then we start to uh, drill. So we, we, we held this brainstorming sessions a lot. Mm -hmm. And the next thing we did was we moved on to plan and execute what at that time was such a novel, novel idea and still remains such. Um, we, we launched the development dialogue, which is mm -hmm. definitely still a leading thought leadership conference for the space. Yeah. And I can't wait to see all the great things that is going to happen with um, development dialogue going forward. Anyway, we had the first one May of that year and it was free. And we, we you know, sent these very specific targeted invitations to friends in the nonprofit space, wrote out to partner organizations bigger than us, Nigerian um, network of NGOs and an NGO, you know, and that's how I started to meet a lot of these partners. And we, we got these people into the room, you know, made it available for free, brought Benga Chesson, had a fantastic networking session, and then provided meals. But while they were in the room, we distributed them into impact areas. We gave them case studies, and we told them to create solution papers for us, that if an organization is facing this kind of challenge. So we took the different challenges people told us about, organizations told us about during the brainstorming session and then we created them into scenarios mm -hmm. distributed yeah. these guys into impact areas and gave them each the scenarios and say what would be your solution and these guys started to brainstorm for us handed us the solution papers boom we took it back and we started to work with it again to say okay it looks like these are the big issues and these are the possible solutions mm. and from then we started to create seminars we had mentorship immersions with the solutions they shared with us. We went back again, development dialogue, November of that year, brought more thought leaders, dealt with those issues. So we spent two years just sort of solidifying our framework for what we believe to be the real answers. So if you see us doing Africa Masterclass series and we're focusing on some issues, it's because over time we've proven by expertise, by data gathering, right? And by listening to the people in the space, we know what works. So our consulting is grounded. Our education is grounded. Our conferencing is grounded because we know what works. So those were the beginning days. And then the, I will say two more things about those early days that still stay with me. The second thing was I got no's and I was not afraid of getting no's. Ah, I told you, no, 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 I got no's. Ah. Take it with me. I, I, I love that you're sharing this, man. Yes. So, I mean, because we would reach out to organizations for partnerships, for funding, for sponsorship, for support. And I had all these nicely done proposals, consulting background, back, 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 back. But some would never even reply. Some would tell you, wow, big idea. We're partnering with you till the day of that conference. You keep calling. They won't come through. Right. And, and some will not come through until two days to the conference. And you'll be like, thank God, thank God. Just what I needed. Right. And some will say big no's to you. So we got a lot of no's, but it really also helped us recognize the principles of corporate partnership because we didn't know that earlier as well. There's a way the nonprofit arena is shaped that we believe the, the, the for-profit corporate arena has to just support us because what we're doing changes the world. Yeah. It doesn't work that way. So we also learned that the hard way, like you've mm. got to, provide value you've got to show where the value is for them right and you've got to build those relationships for the long term i'm not even sure like i'm really still 
great at relationship building. I can do better. My, I, I believe Ideation Hub itself can do better. The project director is right here. Yeah. Um, yes, but obviously, yes. we learned those lessons. We built those relationships. And then a third big thing for us was um, I, I learned early that if I didn't have the money that I needed to pay a large team, I could successfully run a volunteer-led model. And that model continues to be an important part of how we do what we do. And we encourage social innovators to adopt it. They are well-meaning Africans who want to build with you. Well-meaning Africans who want to partner with you, right? And you've got to give them those opportunities and show them where those um, linkages exist to plug into your organization and partner with you. So those things are were definers for the beginning days and some are still useful till now. Yes, ma'am. Wow, wow. Thank you so much for sharing. I, I love how you emphasized that you you you, you embarked on a two-year journey of just really refining the idea through brainstorming sessions with other key stakeholders in the industry. You yes. didn't you didn't you didn't you didn't embark on a journey alone. You 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 pressed in with an ecosystem, so you you were coming into um, um, a sector that definitely you had some experience, but you didn't say, oh yeah yeah yeah, I had some experience. Let me run alone. You yes, decided no. to now begin to look for mentorship, you know, leveraging the power of mentorship with key stakeholders who had gone ahead of you and yeah. brought them together into that space, and that's why. What we're doing at the African Masterclass Series is so, 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 you can't, you can't just joke with it. It's that same model that we're really truly taking and we're really, we are dispensing with the African Masterclass Series. And that's how, you know, as a result of that journey, Ma, you were able to birth, you know, that model that we call the Lean Learn Lip model, you know, that we have on our website and which literally describes IHA as an organization. Thank you so much for sharing. I also love the, 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 the emphasis on not being afraid to hear the word no, even when you begin to seek funding and so many other things and leveraging the, the volunteer-led model. Thank you so much, Ma, for sharing. My pleasure. Yes, Ma. So, uh, Ma, um, from our website, we can see that at the very center of everything that we are and that we do, we would find lifelong learning. How does this reflect on you as an individual and the organization that we run called, called Ideation of Africa. So your question is on um, the value of life lifelong learning. learning. Yes. Okay. I love this so much because um, I believe it, it is a, at, at minimum, it's a two-throng conversation. On the one hand, I believe that we sort of seek to build a learning organization ourselves. Um, you know, so internally, we were always having these conversations, learning as we even implement projects. We are, you know, sometimes sharing all these articles, uh, having these review sessions amongst ourselves. One of the biggest gifts for anybody who works with Ideation Hub is that you will grow by learning on the job. You would really grow. It's it's the biggest thing that happens with anyone who volunteers with us or is a member of staff with us. You would grow, you would learn, you would, um, you would really harness the power of a thinking team and it will sharpen your competencies, right? And um, so true. on the one side, we are seeking to build a learning organization ourselves. We have focus areas that we work on every year. And what you find is, at the start of the year, when we start to say these are our strategic direction, these are big five areas or big three areas, we don't have all the answers about the space. But for us to execute anything meaningful in that direction, we start to learn, we start to read, we start to ask questions. And uh, I mean, it, it, it shows in you know how we uh, execute our projects and how we do the work that we do. On the second side, there is still also this very important dimension of, uh, of uh, primarily being an organization that delivers education. And I know that sometimes it could even get like 
a little frustrating for mm. for even the organization where you feel like are we doing enough are we doing enough you know it just looks like yeah. okay yeah you're creating a school yeah okay is that all and you may want to even look at your beneficiaries because in our case we don't reach communities we reach those who reach communities so we're like a b2b business right and sometimes in your quest for impact you almost want to ask yourself are we doing enough you know when you hear for example somebody's creating a blood bank you're like oh my god right or someone has created like uh, uh, maybe an agricultural technology that allows processing to be faster or allows storage to be easier. You're like, wow. But you've got to recognize that the fundamental foundation of any meaningful impact across any arena of influence in the world is quality education, education. right? Within and outside the classroom. We all are products of the streams of counsel and intelligence that come to us. And maybe that is just my pep talk to my guys at Ideation Hub, my team members, like what you are doing counts big time, big time. I'm, I'm literally building what is gonna become a multi-million dollar learning corporation across coaching, social impact advisory, spiritual development, visionary leadership every stream of my expression has a strong learning part to it has a strong equipping dimension right i am a mobile university and that's what we're building so that's just to say that um education is the bedrock of any meaningful impact mm. any meaningful impact across society you know it's it's what it is and you want to really continue to give that we want to continue to do that. So lifelong learning internally, we're building a learning organization ourselves. And then that's what we're doing for the world. Of course, there's learning, uh, there is consulting, uh, there is the ecosystem building, creating those networks, opportunities for us to come together, the conferences and the connection points we are creating, um, even for our people to meet thought leaders and all of that. Education is at the very center of everything that we're doing. Wow. wow. Thank you so much, Mark, for sharing. I just love the, the two-value approach, which speaks to us as a learning organization and the fact that on the second hand, we are delivering quality education to the, um, to the um, sector that we play. And that's why most times I tell my guy, and I think it's, I, I heard this from you, Ma, that Ideation of Africa is, is the average university of social innovation in Africa. Basically, yeah. so yeah. just always see yourself. We are the Harvard University of Social Innovation in Africa. Thank yes. you so much, Mark, for sharing these very it. invaluable lessons. We're, we're indeed grateful. So, my following up on this, um, can you share with us some of the key learnings you have garnered along the way that will prove beneficial for social innovators if they keep abreast of it? I know you have shared some, but we know there are, there is more. Okay, um, let me let me make it go at that. I will keep it to three because I do know that we have maybe some 17 minutes more. I also want people to be able to ask us questions, questions. before we go. Um, so I'm going to keep it to three lessons that have shaped my life. The first is the gap between when you get the vision and when you manifest the vision has the footprints of so many people on it. The journey between when you get the vision and when you manifest it has the footprints of so many people on it. And you've got to know those people, right? They're people who have walked the path that you want to walk. You've got yeah. to find them out. And this thing is what I love to call intellectual humility. No matter how brilliant you are, there are things you don't read in a book. There are things that come with walking a path. And if you've never walked a path you are about to walk, you had better be speaking to those who've gone ahead of you. They don't even have to have stepped into a formal you know, university as an example for them to have invaluable counsel to offer you. Yeah. yeah, so that's the first big lesson for me. I remember when I determined that I wanted to 
um, start Ideation Hub Africa, January of that year when I said, we're starting this, yeah. we're getting registered, we're going, we're doing this. And I was so pumped, right? Mm -hmm. I, I, I booked a session with Yadoni uh, Olubode, who at the time was ED at Faith at uh, Leap Africa. I also mm -hmm. went to have a conversation with um, a few other persons in the space, um, Mrs. Osai Alile spoke to her, spoke to uh, Mrs. Elizabeth Olofi, um, mm. Adetunwa Dewale, a few persons that I knew were leaders in the space, you know, and I started to ask all these questions like, can you guide me? Can you share with me? What should I be thinking about? What should I be doing different? Um, I was so hungry and I still mm. always do that. I still always yes. just ask a lot of questions, people around, what do you think? What do you think? And um, it's not because you don't have counsel, like you don't have a sense of direction. It's because you want to consolidate on the direction that you have because the journey is really far. You want to eat and be well fed. So the first thing mm -hmm. here is uh, those important conversations you should be having with those who've gone ahead of you. I don't even want to call it mentorship because sometimes it's one conversation you should have right? Mm. So sometimes people are saying, DDK, mentor me. And that's not what you should be saying. They should say, DDK, I want to start this thing and I want your counsel. You see, mm. when you say mentor me, you, you are becoming a bit long-term in the expectation mm. of what we, and, and in the architecture of that relationship. Sometimes you mm. just want counsel on your way, mm. something for your back pocket and you keep moving. So wow. you don't need all that many mentors like you think you need, but you need a lot of counselors. Yes. In the multitude of counselors, there is safety. safety. So yeah, you yeah. take people to lunch. Can I take you to lunch? Can I drop by at your office? Can I send you an email? You know, yeah, yeah. you do all of that. You ask questions. Can, 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 can I have, have one hour on a Zoom call with you? I just want to clarify. I did that with Isaiah Olabi. He was one of the first persons I spoke to, gave me a lot of big ideas. You know, and those things really, really ground you and they give mm. you a balance. You're not so excited that you forget that there are real challenges. Um, mm. So intellectual humility will be a first for me. A second um, for me would be being very data oriented. I want to really beg on this one. You are going to be an easy leader in the pack if you are data oriented. Right, okay. and it's, we, we know there's a data challenge, but you can close that gap. Ask, you know, your ask questions from your beneficiaries. In fact, I'm going to flip it so that it sings better. Have a beneficiary-led, data-driven approach. A beneficiary-led, data-driven approach. What that means is you cannot solve pro uh, a problem for a people who you don't know and who have not told you where it is paining them. We do this thing a lot. Impact makers have ambitious assumptions about mm. what the problem is. Therefore, because they have this faulty basis of problem definition, they by every means will have a faulty execution of assumed solutions. And I'm not intending to be sounding Sean, Sean, I'm serious. <laughs> if you have get a faulty definition of what you believe the problem is, you are going to have a faulty execution of whatever answer you are creating. Do you understand? Mm. It's so important. You've got to let your beneficiaries lead you. How can you say you want to do something for rural female entrepreneurs and you are sitting in Lagos and you are just Googling and typing what you want to do, creating concept notes, except you just mm. want to use it to collect maybe funding and you're just creating your own proposal. But if you really want to do the job, you will enter Badagri. You will enter a rural you will get mm. into the interlands and ask questions and have conversations and observe. You will set yourself in the context of your beneficiaries. Mm. Right? And when you yeah. host events for them, you still ask for their feedback. You still do these surveys just so that you get a strong sense of what they're looking for and how your, your, your uh, interventions are helping them. So have a beneficiary-led data-driven approach. It's really important. Mm. Even entrepreneurs need this as well. You just really need to build solutions that uh, are grounded in extensive problem definition that is close to the experience of the people um, that you're leading. Mm. A third thing that I want to also speak to, in our case, we 
we didn't even really get a lot of funding on the journey. Um, we've always found ourselves, you know, uh, raising funds internally. Um, and that is why we're not a nonprofit. We are a social impact business. We're social enterprise. We earn from our services, right? And we want you to please be a part of those that give us value for the value we give. AMS2 is free for this period. Jump on it, be a part. And when there are things to pay for, do that for us because it helps us do more. Um, yes. However, we've started to receive funding. We've started to receive support from well-meaning organizations. And we've often crowdfunded for resources, right? And thank you to anybody who's ever given us 5K or 1K or 2K on social media. We are so grateful. You help us do the work we do. But well, here's where I'm going. We need accountability. Mm. There, one of the biggest challenges in the impact space is this lack of accountability. There are people mm. who start foundations just so that they can get funding. There are people who are in health today, uh, malaria, HIV today, tomorrow they're in agriculture. Mm -hmm. By the next proposal cycle, they're in education. After that, they move to you know, energy and clean water, health, sanitation. They are just everywhere for whatever is able to get the money. Okay, um, that is an impact maker that is trying to get an impact maker's attention. Anyway... Um, so a third thing here for me is definitely accountability. Yes, ma'am. You know, I'm hoping that as we work together to build the continent, we are going to raise more genuine, um, accountable um, uh, uh, solution creators and visionaries, you know, yeah. who have integrity and who yeah. are here for the right reasons, right? Yes. And one of the important parts of demonstrating accountability it's not just in character. Accountability is not just a matter of character. <laughs> it's yeah. a business phenomenon, right? It shows in your reporting. Um, yeah. It shows in your uh, regulatory remittances. It shows in your compliance. It shows in your corporate governance. Those things, I believe, will keep you in the game for long because people yeah. have a way of telling and testing if what you're here for and if your motives are right and if, if you deserve uh, those opportunities that you're seeking, um, yeah. you know, on the journey. So three things on my part would definitely be intellectual humility and differentiating mentorship from counsel. You can just go for counsel and consulting help. Um, the second, of course, would be um, around, what did I share? Secondly? Uh, the, the second um, is around yeah, having a beneficially led data led driven approach, approach. approach. And then three, and the third, yes, ma'am. Yes, Thank you so much, ma. Wow. Um, just before we open up um, the floor to receive questions from um, everyone who was joined in at this moment, uh, ma, I would like to ask one or two additional questions. Um, and um, these questions take um, is is um, suited towards your passion for Africa. Why do you believe in Africa so much? And why do you bet on our, greatest, our greatness so much? Why, why not? I mean, I think the question is, why won't you believe in Africa? Why won't you bet on her greatness? Now, for yes. me, three things. Number one, the, one of the greatest signs about the destiny of Africa is that I'm born in it. Yes. <laughs> like, hey, yes. I'm here. One of the biggest proofs. Wow that Africa has an indefatigable, promising, prosperous destiny, is that I'm African. Look at me. Yes. Every yes. inch a person's <laughs> destiny myself. So that's, that's my, I mean, look, we, 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 where you are is a sign of where your greatest investments should go. The of, your, of, your, of the, the, the place of your birth, the place of your origin more actually more than birth the matter of the place of your origin is 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 a, is is a significant predictor of what should catch your heart it's, mm. it's what it is 
Right, so that's the first thing for me. I'm passionate about Africa because I'm African. And I'm, yes. African, I'm African's <laughs> prediction of greatness. Yes. Yeah, I'm, I'm right here. She's going to be great. Yes. <laughs> the second thing is we actually have what history recognizes to be one of the most powerful triggers of globalization, of mm. development, and mm. of intercontinental prosperity. And it's our agile young population. Like, mm. we're, we're, we're the gold mine. Whenever yeah. you see an agile, brimming young population, all you have to do is start to think about channeling the young energy productively, which is where our work is as Africans, right? And as impact makers for the continent, we've got to harness and channel the energy of the young people, right? And give them an aspiration so we can build together. But anytime you see a brimming, agile young population, that is a telltale sign of a prosperous future. Absolutely. Yes. yes. Even from Bible times, we've yes. got this living, breathing memorial in scripture of a nation that was being built into a global world power by the, by the agile young population of another nation that it, it enslaved. And mm -hmm. then arose deliverers who liberated that nation, right? And the flip of the power shifted in their direction because it's not about, it's not about Egypt. It's about the Israelites building Egypt. Wow. And you remember scripture said they were multiplying. They were uncontrollably multiplying. Mm. And that's why they started to get the midwives to go cut them off. I mean, it's like, it's, it's, look at it. We're just going to be great. Yeah. <laughs> the yes. third thing about Africa is without doubt, without argument. And that's why we have this creativity export moving to the West. The yes. continent of Africa stands out by its extreme creativity, its extreme artistry, its extreme genius, its extreme brilliance. Yes. It's yes. what we have. No yes. matter how you condemn, you can condemn an Afri uh, the, the black for being twisted in how they utilize yeah. their creativity, right? Or you can condemn them for not uh, being bankable with their creativity yes. because yes. of these paradigms of slavery. And we're on yes. about that. We're dealing with that. Give us some time. Yes. But you yes. can't take away from the African continent to be the, the, the melting point of extreme creative genius. And whenever you find creativity, at history, brilliance, genius, you are going to literally step into enthronement so far you put that gift to proper use. And those are the things that make me relentless about my commitment to build social saviors who are going to build this continent with me. Wow. Thank you, Mark, for sharing. I just love how you, you kick started with, you know, the power of understanding, you know, your origin and how that plays to your greatness as an individual, and then taking us, you know, down history as to why Africa is great, and then giving us an insight into the gifts and the talents and the potentials of Africa. Thank you so much, Mark. Ma, I know that. Um, you know, whilst on this journey, um, you must have had maybe, maybe not necessarily, but maybe, maybe a tough experience that may have almost led you to ants off on the social media. How did you navigate, you know, such a period? Um, so to be honest, right, my first honest, honest answers, uh, my first honest, honest answers I, I'm a really, really, really resilient person, to be honest. Yes. If I believe I've been sent somewhere, my conviction powers my pursuit. So maybe backing down um, isn't something that I've actively ever considered, <laughs> to be honest. Yes. So I, I, yeah, if I, if I get overwhelmed or tired, I go for renewal and I come back into the game as God helps me. Um, so I expect that a visionary journey has challenges. So 
I come, I come with a certain type of posture, you know. Mm -hmm. so, yeah, there's a way I position my thinking, my emotions to be like, how do we solve this? As against this is going to conquer us, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, having said that, I would still say my biggest challenge on the path of being a, a visionary, an entrepreneur, an impact maker, is how the human capital crisis in Africa trickles down to the work that I do. Ah, okay. oh, yeah. yeah. definitely. I mean, those are the kind of things that have kept me awake at night, praying. Sometimes I've cried like, gosh, how can, what's going on? And it's not just heartbreaking because you're thinking about your own work. You're also just seeing the waste of potential. I mm. see so many young, bright people who are willing to put the work, who do shoddy work, error, mm. error you know, laden work, who, who are so spread out across too many commitments that they are useless on every of them. And they don't even know they're doing that, you know. Um, people who don't have the right competence and who won't build themselves. People who see uh, bosses or leaders who want excellence as being hard and difficult and unkind, you know. So it's even tough to help them because they are toxic to themselves and they don't even know it. Whereas mm -hmm. everybody else is toxic, but they're the ones who are the problems because problems. they have chosen a path of mediocrity. And the path mm -hmm. of mediocrity, you know, has a very clear outcome. You can never enter into the fullness of destiny and the future that you have you know, waiting to be unveiled with a mediocre life. So there's a little painful degree of incompetence and, you know, and, and just mediocrity and laziness, plain laziness sometimes. People mm. who earn, but who don't justify their pay, that one breaks my heart because I'm just like, how do you do this to a young entrepreneur? How do you earn whatever you are paid and you can't justify that pay? You know, Mm. Um, so that that's a stressful challenge yes. that comes through. Um, to be honest, compared to what I hear my friends and clients say to me, I still feel like I've had, you know, I've had a good experience. Yes, I was yeah. say I'm so blessed to be balanced. Too. I'm so blessed with a lot of great people across my different teams. I mean, look at us in Ideation Hub. A lot of bright guys working with us. Look yes, at nice. you yourself. Uh, my other businesses. So I'm thankful. Yeah. It, it keeps me, uh, and that that thankfulness, my gratitude helps me not be here spoiled. I think mm. I would say. Because I see how helped I have been, I still don't throw tantrums mm. and just go about feeling like, you know, I'm going to deal with this person. So it helps mm. me even manage transitions. Even when I want a person to exit my team, I do it with a lot of honor and love because I still feel like I've been so blessed with the gift of people. It's a gift I've had um, yes, you know, for the longest time in my life. Yeah. Yes, ma'am. Thank you so much for sharing, Mar. Um, um, we've truly, truly been empowered just hearing you share the journey of um, IHA. And it's really has been very, very interesting, not just interesting, really transformational. Thank you so much, Mar. At this juncture, I will want to open up the floor to our participants. If you have any questions um, for us, please type in the comments section and definitely we would um, be able to provide answers in the next few minutes. So let's do that quickly. Thank you so much, um, Inamika, Fumilola, Fumilayor, Sarah, Nene. Yes, thank you for joining us. So if you have any question, just drop it in in the comment section. So Ma, while we're on that, Ma, let me just take this last, last question, Ma. Can you share with us remarkable moments that solidified in your heart that what you're doing is effective and worth it? Wow. <laughs> I love, love, love that question. Uh, and I have, I have quite a number. So uh, maybe my first will be um, what is something that things that stand out in my heart? Because I've I've had quite a number, honestly. Yeah. Okay, I think that one uh, one of them would be getting into Mandela Washington Fellowship 
Yay! Yes. So true. Uh, yes. Getting in, and it's not just because I consider that uh, fellowship to be really truly prestigious for mm. some of the leading Af uh, young African leaders on the continent, um, but also because during my interview, I had very interesting, a very interesting experience. Right? Yeah. Like, I mean, my I I bared my heart out about my work during my interview. And I remember my interview was like really going emotional in the in the, yeah. during the interview, like my God, this is so powerful. You know, they weren't meant to make me know what they thought. I was just yeah. meant to then get this email, but they were. Just, it was so obvious that okay, maybe this thing has value, right? And they went on and on and on. And then I got into the program, and I became like so beloved to my other African friends. And they were saying, Debola, you have to bring this thing to other other countries. You you got to bring it to us. We need this thing. And every time I got a chance to just share, just generally speaking, it will be answers for them. And I'll be like, okay, maybe this thing makes some sense then, right? It was yeah. so validating. I sat on policy committees, sharing roadmaps that I believed was going to lead us into the future as a continent. Um, I still believe in those things. When I was leaving, I got the chance to give this Ignite talk on how yes. to fight. <laughs> you know, and I still yeah. get called, I still get chat, yeah. people reaching me and saying, oh my God, how can you, how could you have distilled, um, you know, social impact so powerfully? Yeah. And, um, you know, I'm now working on a book by the same title. Yay! You guys, before this year is over. So that, that stood out and really solidified the power of the work we're doing. Another yes. would be looking at our awardees um, from 2015 yeah. Talents of the Future Awards, um, which was a celebration of these young, outstanding social innovators doing great work and who we believed yes. were going to take the lead off in the coming years. And we yes. have uh, we have uh, Raphael. Uh, I yes. can't remember at this moment, but one of my very beloved, you know, Aburos, we've got Raphael um, yes. over there. We've got um, uh, Tammy. Tammy Topaz Salami. Yes, Salami, yes. you know, of yes. Echo Warriors. And we have a number of these other people that I still see doing big, big work. And when I find them referring to that award, saying, look, this helped me. It gave me the strength I needed to believe in myself and move the work forward. It really challenges me like, okay, yes, this, is, this is adding value to the people in the space, right? And there's this, this multiplier effect right of their own work impacting others so that definitely is something special for me um can i say that every development dialogue the caliber of people we bring to development dialogue validates the work we do you see because yes. they get all kinds of invitations every time but for them to choose to turn up to us some have come three times right to choose yes. to turn up every time we call on them i find it mind-blowing and i want to just take a moment to thank every single speaker who we've ever had a development dialogue you know you yes. make me know that the work is worth it we've had the yes. best up on yes. up to the uh, uh, the country director of african development bank you know join yes. us at our development dialogues so those yes. things remind me i'm doing brilliant work two more things the quality of team members i have every season even when yes. some leave and transition some go yes. for their masters abroad my yes. team members make me know I'm doing good work. And mm -hmm. this is a special shout out to every one of you. Our yes. volunteers make us also know we're doing good work, yes. right? We've got these yes. brilliant volunteers. And I mean, you're just like, how do we even have all these smart guys being a part yes. of us? Finally, AMS One. Uh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> AMS One, African Masterclass yeah. Series One, and all the yeah. amazing Look yes. at the, the, the uh, solution papers that yes. these guys gave to us. Winning solutions. What? Gosh. All 9,000 or so of you, thank you so much. Like, thank yes. you. Yes. AMS 1 validated that we're definitely getting this right. And AMS 2 is going to validate it at a bigger level. So you yes. have to register. African Masterclass Series 2 is on. And yes. for everyone who ever said, Oh, okay. I feel like AMS one. Um, some of it was still above me. I feel like I'm starting out. I'm young. I don't have all the answers. This one is sweeter because it comes yes. down and breaks it down to your level. 
and it uses the power of storytelling. You are yes, going to love it 100%. Yes, ma'am. Thank you so much, Ma. Thank you so much, Ma. So, Ma, we'll quickly take a question from Nene, which says, what, have be, what has been the most surefire values you have provided for your volunteers to keep them committed to the vision? How do I not feel guilty about not give, giving them financial rewards? That's such a good question. Yes. And after I speak to it, uh, Tony, I'm going to ask that you say one or two things as well because you're like the queen of the volunteer-led model and all that. <laughs> um, okay. Here is what I'm going to say to you, Nene. You have become who you have become because you are a powerful volunteer. At least I know that because you know, you're not just a team member to me currently. You volunteered across many things that I know about, including my own organization. So you've grown expertise. You've grown leadership. You've grown personal confidence. You've grown self-mastery. You've grown life architecture, life design by, by volunteering. So never ever forget this, that the biggest gift that you give people when they volunteer with you is who they become. The salary offered in a volunteer experience is who people become. So this is how you must never feel guilty anymore. Very true. It's Very who true. they become, right? So what yes. you pay attention to is the quality of experience yes. that you give them. And to surprise That's you, the right. quality of experience you give them is connected to the quality of work you give them to you do. Give them. Yes. 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 That's it. You, That's you, it. You, let me tell you, when you give people yeah. good work, you are yeah. demonstrating a sense of respect for their expertise that yes. help us crack this thing. We believe you can do it. Yeah, yes. yeah, it's what it is. Yes. I give people so good work in a volunteer system as if I'll pay them a million with my full yes. chest. Go yes. on, go and do it because I volunteer as well. It's who they become. So that's a big gift. And I still have volunteers many years after who say, DDK, everything I'm doing now, I learned it. And I'll say, you have to pay me. That thing you're telling me, you have to come back and pay me some money. Because look at who you become, right? So that's definitely um, the first thing. The second thing I would say is be upfront about what is in it for the guys. So you have to yes. think about that. You've got to be upfront about that. You know, nobody should ever join your volunteer team thinking there's money where there's no money. Thinking there's one right. steep when you don't plan to give it. Or thinking they have why. free of access to you. Even exactly. for my volunteer models, my, yeah. my directors run it in a way that they don't promise that you will now become DDK's friend. It's so not possible. You, <laughs> you don't see me come on your game. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. So you've got to be clear what is in it for them. And you yes. clarify that, right? The third thing is there are non-financial rewards that are yeah. valuable and weighty. So yes. mentorship can be a non-financial reward. Access to your programs for free can be a non-financial reward. Access yes. to programs by partners can be a non-financial yes. reward. Um, the community you expose them to can be a non-financial reward. Your yes. commitment to give them um, um, recommendation letters for their job applications, for their yes. uh, educational applications can be a non-financial reward. So yes. you've got to think through all that, right? And then finally, please never keep a non-performing volunteer on your team volunteer. because you feel like you can't pay them. You are doing a disservice to your vision, to them, that's and right. to others who would have done that's better. Right. So that's never right. keep out and say, oh, since I'm not paying, maybe that's why. Oh, God, come and be going. Yes. He's not going to do the work. Yeah. So those would be some things I could share with you. Yes. Thank you so much, Ma, for sharing. Just to add to what you shared, also, I'm just layering on the fact that you should not keep um, a non-functional or, or valuable um, um, volunteer in your team. What you can also do from time to time is to ensure you have an effective evaluation or, or performance evaluation system in place. Don't say they are just volunteers and you don't assess their performance. You must be able to assess their performance. And also, try as much as possible to throw open your voluntary opportunities on an annual basis. So, you know, there are people, just someone just asked the question here saying, oh, um, are there opportunities for 
are to join um, IHA, definitely. And, and please, um, I would ask one of our team members to please drop the link in the comment section so you can fill that form. Definitely, the opportunity is always open annually. So please always create that structure, create that performance evaluation system, in, put that in place, and also make open your volunteering um, um opportunity on an annual basis and again you can also reevaluate how you recruit you may want to say maybe starting out your starting as being a startup um, or an early stage social and um, entrepreneur innovator you may want to kick off by running your volunteer structure on a project on a project-based approach because it may be overwhelming running it you know all year through so just look at what best suits you know you at that time and go for it i hope this um definitely answers all of your question, questions thank you so much someone here is asking a question ma'am and this is from peace martins it says for a young person not sure how to launch out into the social innovation space could you please share how i can start out okay ma just Wait before a minute. you Wait a minute. Wait a minute. <laughs> is it please like go for it just register for this program like there's nothing else to hey god do <laughs> just get into african masterclass series and let me tell you the way to be a great friend and i must mention this right is to ensure that you're growing with your network we want to really the gift you can give us is to push this into your communities send it by email put it on whatsapp status put it in groups and please don't say oh it's for these ngo people no our, our higher goal this year, going forward, yes. is what we call the democratization of innovation. And yes. to make that not sound like big English, <laughs> we want everyday people to have the tools for changing their communities, Every yes. everybody. So we're even going to have AMS Pigeon, African Masterclass Series in Pigeon. Yes, that's you know, loading. That's exactly, loading. that's loading. So don't say it's for them, the NGO is for everybody. It's for every yes. single person. Yes. Okay. Thank you so much, ma'am. Um, please share, we, the, 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 the registration link is running across the screen, but nonetheless, we would also share it again in the comment section so you can, you can, you just can click it and then register. Thank you so much, ma. Gosh, it's been a power-packed evening. Just hearing you share the IHA story, um, not uh, notwithstanding the fact that I'm a part of a family, it's also you know refreshing to again hear the story. And I and I can't imagine those who are getting to hear the story, you know, just for the very first time. And I, I can bet it, I'm getting so many um, positive um, feedback here saying this has really been very impacting. There's been so much clarity. Um, someone here saying, thank God for the gift of DDK. Yes, thank you, Ma. We really do appreciate you. So Ma, just before we close um, this beautiful um, session, we want you to just share your final words with our participants um, just before we, we, we end this great session. Okay, my final words will be go and register. <laughs> I love that. Please like, go and register for African Master Class. Yes, 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 yes. So that's it. It's as simple as that. Go and register. Go and register. Go and register. So a lot of you and those who will get to um, watch the, the replay, please, even in the um, description for this um live session the link is embedded in there so it's just you're just a click away just click and register so we look forward to welcoming you into class on monday we are super pumped we are ready for you and it promises to be an exciting time of transformation social transformation personal transformation within the next five weeks and we're super excited yes for that sister or brother who asked for the link to join um, a voluntary opportunity please it's been dropped in the comment section so please click away um yes yes thank you thank you for the feedback you have already registered and please again didika has said that you can learn alone please influence your sphere influence your community influence your friends you know learn as an ecosystem learn as a body have, build an accountability um, system by learning alongside your bodies and get them to register yes one last thing 
we are taking AMS to the universities. And definitely on our own, we have already started, you know, we have um we have we have some major contacts that we have started running with. So please, if you have um access to um um key stakeholders who 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 are in charge of um groups or bodies like JCI, ISEC, global shapers across universities in Nigeria and across Africa and the world, please write to us at masterclass at a masterclass at ideationofafrica.org. Yes, share this um, information with us, share the content information with us. We are ready to receive them because we want to have as many young, vibrant um, um, individuals in the universities and colleges of education join in the African masterclass. Just as Diki has said, we are democratizing social innovation and we want to cut them young. So definitely we look forward to um, seeing you all on Monday, Definitely also be our champions. Use um, the customized poster link to create your customized posters, share within your community of influence, and definitely again, we look forward to a transformational time of learning. Thank you so much, DDK, and thank, thank you, you so all, much. everyone who has been um, with us in the last um, one hour. Um, definitely, this is just a tip of the iceberg. You're going to have a, a, a buffet of knowledge of 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 experiential learning when you step into AMS two on Monday. Love you all, and do see you in class on Monday. Cheers. Bye. Bye.